97, 98, 99. Oh, what? Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> now, where were we? <laughs> oh, yes. Welcome to another Beneath Explanations of Molecular Methodology. Now, today we're going to take off straight from where we left off last time. So, what happened last time? Well, last time we constructed the cDNA library from mRNA. We then uh, screened it through DNA hybridization, and we've now got it in a lambda vector, a nice stable lambda vector. Now, now that we've identified the clone, the cDNA that we want through um, DNA hybridization, it's not so good to work in a lambda vector. The reason for that is, is because if we're working in a plasmid vector, which is much smaller, that means the cDNA that we've inserted is going to um, make up a much greater proportion of the vector than it would be if it was in a lambda vector. So we want to move our DNA from a lambda vector to a plasmid. How do we do that? Well, you could insert the lambda phage into E. coli cells, get loads of plaques, extract the DNA, and then use restriction enzymes to take out the cDNA, which you did insert it, and then insert it into a plasmid vector. But that's a very um, tedious, um, messy process, really. What would have helped if we'd inserted it into a lambda vector, which would make it easier for us to transfer into a plasmid in the first place? Possibly one of the best vectors when transforming from a lambda to a plasmid is this one right here, the lambda zap2 vector. Now what is that? Well, it's a lambda phage, it's got your double-stranded DNA here, you've got your sticky ends at either end. Now there's something special going on in the middle of the lambda phage, it's this bit here, and it's called P blue script. What this part of section of DNA within the lambda phage is, it's actually a piece of plasmid DNA. So, we've got a piece of plasmid inside the lambda vector. Now, if we inserted the cDNA that we wanted within this P blue script section of DNA, here at the multiple cloning site or polylinker, then all we'd need to do is to get it into a plasmid is to take this section out, circularize it, and introduce it into E. coli. Sounds simple, right? And the process on how we do that is called auto-excision. So we're extracting the P blue script from um, the, uh, the rest of the vector. Now, how do we do that? If you can see in this diagram, I don't know whether you can see too clearly, I know this whiteboard's quite far away, so I do apologize about that in advance. What we have at the start of the P blue script sequence is a promoter, specifically, the F1 promoter. Now F1 is another phage, it's another bacteriophage that infects E. coli. So if we introduce this lambda phage, the lambda zap2 phage, into E. coli, and as well as that, the F1 virus or phage, the F1 phage will replicate this DNA, the P blue script strand going from the initiator, which is here, right to the terminator. And it is that that will isolate our P blue script, or phage mid. See what they did there? It's half phage, half plasmid. So it's phage mid. God, they're clever, aren't they? So if we've included some cDNA in there, that will now be incorporated into a plasmid. And this phage mid will then be packaged into proteins and transported. Now, we can use the phage mid within that protein package and introduce it to E. coli. Now, if we look at this phage mid, it's got loads of other um, plasmid characteristics. We've got a blar gene here, which is um, the resistance gene for ampicillin, so antibiotic resistance. And we've also got the LACZ gene. Um, and this, it's in the middle of the LACZ gene where we introduce our cDNA. So we can do screening with XGAL to check for recombinance. So from there, it's all really hunky-dory. We've got it in the plasmid, and now we can work with it a lot more easily. 
And what do we do with our seed DNA after that? Well, what we could do with it is use it as a probe, to probe other DNA sequences. And we do that by making it radioactive and then introducing it to some other foreign DNA by hybridization. Now, the probe we produce doesn't have to bind to DNA, it can also bind to RNA. And this is the technique we're going to explore now. It's called northern blotting. What is that? Now, in the last video, we talked about how we can use differential screening of our cDNA library to see what uh, genes are specifically being expressed in a particular tissue. Now, what northern blotting helps us with is to decide the extent of expression in a particular tissue. What we're going to do is to extract all the RNA from a cell, including all the ribosomal and tRNAs and all the other um, RNAs we have, and we're going to select them from a few different tissues. In this example, we have three, and we're going to allow, um, load them onto an agarose gel. What we're going to do then is to perform gel electrophoresis. So that will mean the uh, three uh, samples of RNA will move along um, the gel according to their size. So if they're really big, they won't move very far. If they're really short, they'll move further along the agarose gel. That bit really doesn't matter because what we're looking for really is a particular mRNA molecule which our probe is complementary to. So what we're going to do after gel electrophoresis has taken place, we're going to introduce a filter, usually a nitrocellulose filter, um, and then on that nitrocellulose filter we're going to fix all the um, mRNA and introduce a probe. That probe could have been made using our P Blue Script um, phage mid. Now, this probe is single stranded, obviously, and will bind to the mRNA, which it is complementary to. And then you'll get a band on your um, photographic film. Now, if you get a really strong band, like we've got in A, that means that. Um, MR, that gene is being expressed a lot because we have lots of mRNA being produced. So there's lots of translation of that gene taking place. If we go over to tissue B, however, I've tried to represent a sort of more faded, um, sort of less shaded look for tissue B. I hope you appreciate my artwork there. Um, so that means it's expressed, but um, not very much. And not, definitely not as much as tissue A. Tissue C, obviously, we have nothing at all. There is no um, mRNA being produced in that tissue. Now, one of the potential problems is here that we could have had unequal loading. There could be much more gene expression in tissue B of the gene that we want than in tissue A, but we've just got more RNA from tissue A to load on. So how do we check that we have an equal amount of um, RNA from each sample. Well, the amount of ribosomal RNA in a cell is roughly equal. So if the uh, bands produced by ribosomal RNA is more or less the same for each sample, then we can be quite confident that we have equal loading of each mRNA that we want. So if the loading of our RNA is equal, we can be relatively confident that the proportions of mRNA in these three samples um, are relatively truthful. Now one of the examples I've been doing in my course is the way we can make plants males sterile. Um, so i.e. not producing any pollen. And to do that, what we have to do is to destroy the lining of the pollen sacs. Um, the pollen sacs are surrounded by cells called tapetal cells. Now, if we introduce um, a toxin, a, a toxic gene, um, in the middle of a gene which is only expressed in tapetal cells, then these tapetal cells will die and the lining of the pollen sacs won't be formed, so pollen grains will not be created. Done and dusted. It's very difficult to isolate to petal cells on their own and extract the RNA from them to do a northern blot. Instead, we've probably come up with a couple, maybe a few, candidate genes that are potentially only expressed into petal cells from all this. So what do we do then? 
what we need to do is RNA in situ hybridization. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, in our example, um, what we're going to do is take a very thin slice from, uh, say, the anthers of a plant, and then what we're going to introduce is a riboprobe. What's a riboprobe? Well, a riboprobe is a probe made from mRNA, more specifically, antisense mRNA. This riboprobe is antisense mRNA, so that means it is complementary to the mRNA that's produced naturally in um, the cells which we've taken a slice from. So if we introduce the antisense mRNA to, um, the, in this case, the slice of plant which we've taken, then this mRNA will bind to the RNA and it will show up on a screen. Then the riboprobes will bind to the naturally produced mRNA and this will be scanned and it will show up on a screen. Now there is absolutely no way I'll be able to draw this on the, um, the whiteboard for me to show you, so we will cut to a diagram now! Now here are the images that the scientists in this particular experiment found. Now as you can see on pretty much on each corner of the segment if you like, there are bright white patches. Now this is where the antisense mRNA has bound to the mRNA produced um, within the cell. And it's here where the torpedo cells are found. This process is kind of a bit messy because if as you take your slice out of your plant, you're probably cutting up, killing um, cells, releasing the mRNA from them, and they go everywhere. And cells in general contain all sorts of rubbish that your antisense um, mRNA may just bind to randomly. This will give you a false positive in real life, so it would seem that the antisense mRNA is binding to mRNA produced in that area of the plant. But really it's not, it's just binding to garbage. So how do we differentiate between what's rubbish and what's actually what we want? But what we do is introduce not an antisense RNA, but a sense mRNA. Now this positive sense mRNA will not bind to mRNA produced in the cell, but it is likely to bind to the same rubbish that the antisense mRNA was binding to previously. So here we can actually discriminate from what's garbage and where the gene that we're probing for using our ribo probe is being expressed. Right, and that's where I'm going to wrap it up today. I hope you enjoyed all that shit, and hopefully I'll be back next week. Hopefully I'll try and make next we every Wednesday a regular thing and come up with a new video on more of this stuff. So that's something to look forward to. God, God, I'm sorry. I've got you all in a frenzy now. But for now, um, <laughs> better start pumping iron, you know. So, see ya. <laughs>